Hello everybody, this is Sam and welcome back to Inglogic. As promised, today we'll be looking at dictionaries and how we can analyse them mathematically in order to use them correctly. So put your thinking caps on and let's get started. Before we delve into the topic though, we need to understand some linguistic jargon, which means all the strange and technical words related to grammar and languages. And it may not sound as cool as the medical jargon that you hear on medical dramas when they talk about things that we don't understand but sound cool. But if it's any consolation, I'm sure that none of the doctors out there know any of the words that we are going to learn today. So we will know something that they don't for a change. We will start by identifying the part of speech that we will use the most in this video. A part of speech is a group of words that share similar grammatical properties, and the ones that we will be focusing on are nouns, which identify an entity. It can be a person, an animal, or a thing. Adjectives, which modify or describe a noun. Verbs, which identify an action. Pronouns, which substitute a noun or a noun phrase. I can say Tom loves Alice, where Tom and Alice are nouns. But I can also say he loves her, where he and her are pronouns. A noun phrase is a group of words that create a noun. So if I say the tall man loves the nice woman, the tall man is a noun phrase which consists of an article, an adjective and a noun. We also have prepositions, which create a relationship between the parts of speech that they connect. It can be a relationship of space. I go to school. I am in London. Of time. I quit on Monday. Or any other kind of logical relationship. The house of my friend. This is for you. Prepositions can also connect verbs to verbs or verbs to other parts of speech. So if I say, I decided to go to bed, the first two connect a verb to a verb and the second two a verb to a noun. We now need to look at syntax, which is the study of the function of words within a sentence, usually related to word order. The three main categories are verb, which identifies an action, subject, which identifies the entity that performs the action, and object, which is the entity that receives the action. In the sentence, my mum eats a cake, my mum is a subject because she does the action of eating a cake, which is the object because it receives the action. A subject can be a person, but also a thing. And an object can be a thing, but also a person. So if I say horror films scare my mum, Horror films is the subject, and my mum, in this case, is the object. Both subjects and objects can be substituted by pronouns, so we have two categories of these. We have subject pronouns, who do the action, and object pronouns, who receive the action. So, in the sentence, horror films scare my mum, horror films, which is a subject, can be substituted by they, and my mum, which is the object, can be substituted by her. So, they scare her. Pronouns are divided into first, second and third person singular and first, second and third person plural. Let's take a closer look at verbs, which are the most important part of speech. To conjugate a verb means to connect it to its subject. As you can see, in some languages, the ending of the verb changes for each person, whereas in some of the languages, it doesn't happen quite as often. And in English, we are fairly lucky because usually in the present simple, it only happens to the third person singular, where we only add an S to the end of the verb. The base form of a verb is a verb in its purest and simplest form, without conjugation. Talk, see, be, have. The infinitive of a verb is the base form preceded by to, so to talk, to see, to be, to have. After this whole chapter on linguistics, I am sure you're ready for some maths. When we look a word up in a dictionary, we find it in its purest form, which can be seen as a mathematical expression that contains constants, which are the elements that don't change, and variables, which are the elements that change. For example, 3 plus x, where 3 and plus are constants and x is a variable because we can allocate several values to it. 
When we speak, we adapt this pure formula to the specific idea that we want to express. And in order to do it correctly, we will analyse which mathematical element each part of speech corresponds to. And before we start, we need to remember that dictionaries use STH for something and SB for somebody. Let's start from something that we're all familiar with. If we look up the word to talk, you find to talk to somebody about something, which is our mathematical expression. And in order to translate it into one, we need to analyse every single element and decide if it's a constant or a variable. So let's start from to talk. We'll take these two words together because the two at the beginning of a verb structure simply gives the infinitive. It has no other value. So to talk is a constant because it's exactly what we want to express. So it corresponds to a number in a mathematical equation. For example, number two. Let's have a look at the preposition two. Does it change or does it stay the same in the structure? Well, prepositions stay the same. You can't change them for other random prepositions. So this equals another constant and we can see it as one of the symbols of the four operations. For example, plus. Now, let's have a look at somebody. Somebody is a variable because we can substitute it for anything that we want to say. We can say, I talk to my mum, to my brother, to my friends, to my teacher. So it's an unknown value, which we can call x. What about about? About is again a preposition and we can't change it for any random preposition. So it has to be a constant value and we would call it minus. Something just like somebody, is considered a variable because we can say whatever we want instead of it. I can talk about money, I can talk about my friends, I can talk about my holiday. So that is our y. So this is our formula, 2 plus x minus y. And when we speak, we need to make sure that whatever we say is always equal to this starting formula. So if I give you some values, I tell you that the subject is i. Somebody, which is our x, is Tom, and something, which is our y, is money. Let's substitute it into the formula. I talk to Tom about money. Because we are saying that 2 plus x minus y equals exactly 2 plus x minus y. If, however, I said I talk to Tom at money, this would be wrong because at is a preposition, which is a constant value. But by saying at, you are telling me that 2 plus x minus y equals 2 plus x divided by y, which is mathematically incorrect. In this instance, I've used the simple present for I talk. But depending on the situation, you can use any tense that you need. You can say I talked, I was talking, I will be talking, I should have talked to Tom about money. This process helps us use a grammar structure correctly, but unfortunately, it doesn't help us understand what preposition this structure needs. Prepositions are a very big problem in every language that has them, because usually there is no defined set of rules that can tell us what preposition to use and why. So once we've learned and memorized each combination for each verb, we can use this process to then apply it correctly to what we are saying. Let's have a look at another example. When I teach my students the verb to depend, I give them the English structure to depend on something or somebody. And what they often say, however, is it depends from the weather. Because in their language, maybe the verb depend is followed by the equivalent of the preposition from. But this is incorrect because to depend on something is to plus y and to depend from the weather would be 2 minus y, which is incorrect. So the correct form is it depends on the weather. If we look at the structure to decide to do something with somebody, we notice that we have a new variable, do, which we will call z. Do represents the verb that we can put inside the structure. So I can decide to play, to sing, to run. So if you follow the values on the slide, you will get she decides to play tennis with her father. Now let's talk about do a little bit longer. 
If do appears inside a grammar structure, it's a variable. It just tells us that in that position, we have to put the verb that we need. But if do appears at the beginning of the structure, we will have to do your homework, for example. In this case, do is the main verb and has its own meaning. It means to perform. So to do your homework becomes I do my homework and we can't replace it with another verb. In the structure to avoid doing something with eat for Z and meat for Y, most of my students will say I avoid eat meat. Now, why is that wrong? If you say I avoid eat meat, you are telling me that eat, which equals Z, equals doing. But we know that Z only equals do. So, if we analyse the original structure mathematically, we don't get to Z, Y, we get to Zing, Y, where Z only represents do. So, the correct version is I avoid eating meat. By the same token, if you say I avoid to eat meat, this is also incorrect because you're adding a to which equals plus, for example, which is not the same as the original formula. Now, we've seen that we can say to avoid doing something with two variables, but not all verbs need all their variables all the time. Sometimes we can simply say to avoid doing. For example, you can say I avoid overeating. You don't need to say something in this case. So if we look at the verb to talk to somebody about something, we don't always need all the variables that it has. Sometimes we can simply say we talk. Careful, the same verb can have different prepositions in different languages. And sometimes if it has a preposition in English, maybe it doesn't have it in another language or the other way around. A lot of learners would say I asked to my friend for help because in their native language, the verb ask is followed by the equivalent of to. But in English, that's not the case because the structure is to ask somebody for something. So it would be, I asked my friend for help. Now let's look at a compound structure to try to do, where the value for Z, do, is avoid doing something. In this case, if I want to give you the value for the do of avoid doing, I can't use Z again because it would be a repetition. So I need to give you a completely different variable, which we will call W. And W will be eat and something, Y, will be meat. So if we put all of those elements together, we get he tries to avoid eating meat. A lot of people say I'm thinking to go on holiday. Now, why is this wrong? It is wrong because the structure that we have in English is to think about doing something. So the only option that we have is I'm thinking about going on holiday. And what we need to remember is that if a verb is preceded by a preposition, it is always in its ing form. So about going on the holiday. The only exception is the preposition to, which is usually followed by the base form. So I decided to go to bed. However, there are a couple of exceptions that we simply need to learn. For example, I'm looking forward to meeting you. We can't say I'm looking forward to meet you. Some verbs can be followed by more than one preposition without changing their meaning, but this is only possible if you see it in a dictionary. For example, we can say to talk to somebody, but also to talk with somebody. Let's look at the sentence, Tom talked to his mum about his friends. Here we've used nouns, Tom, his mum, his friends, but we can also substitute them for pronouns. Tom is a third person singular, male, so it will be either he or him. Her mum is a third person singular, female, so it will be either she or her. His friends is a third person plural, so it will be either they or them. Now, how can we decide if these pronouns are subjects or objects? As we said before, subjects perform the action and objects receive the action. And in general, the rule is that if a pronoun comes after a verb and or 
it is not the subject of a conjugated verb, it's always an object. So we will get he talked to her about them, where his mum is an object, her, and his friends is an object, them. The same mathematical approach applies to nouns and adjectives. If we look up the noun interest, we find interest in something. So we can't say his interest at animals, but in animals. You are proud of somebody, so he is proud of me. And now I want to look at some constructions that are often misused in English. For example, I want that he helps me, and I'm waiting that he calls me. These, unfortunately, are incorrect in English because their grammar structure is to want somebody to do something, to wait for somebody to do something, and also to expect somebody to do something. So, the correct version of these options would be I want him, object, to help me. I'm waiting for him to call me. He expects me to help him. Because the variable do Z in the structure is in its base form, that means that it never changes even if the tense of the whole sentence does. So I can say, I wanted him to help me. I should have waited for him to call me and he will expect me to help him. Where the first verb changes in tense, but not the second. Okay, I have nothing else to teach you for today. I hope you find this video useful and I think this method is very helpful when you look up a word on your own without a teacher that can help you use it correctly. Based on what you find in a dictionary, try to elaborate the corresponding equation and then you simply substitute the values that you need. Please don't forget to like this video and to subscribe to my channel and also to leave comments if you have any questions or observations. And now after this insane combination of maths and grammar, you're free to get some rest and I will see you soon.